Welcome to this presentation titled How to Kill a Silicon Carbide MOSFET Errors in Gate Circuit Design. My name is Martin Warnke. I'm working as an applications engineer for wide band gap devices within On Semiconductor. I would like to start this presentation by guiding you through some device basics that are relevant for a good understanding of the following topics. First, let's talk about the silicon carbide MOSFET gate dielectric. Silicon carbide MOSFETs contain a conventional silicon dioxide. As it is not a naturally grown oxide, the interface between the semiconductor material and the oxide is less stable than in silicon devices and the oxide therefore is more sensitive to field stress. Any applied overvoltage may lead to trapping and degradation effects that will eventually lead to gate leakage, which may result in a short circuit event with catastrophic results to the system. To prevent any degradation or damage, the voltage on the gate needs to stay within the maximum limits that are given in the device data sheet. In this example of an on-semiconductor 1200 volt 20 milliohm silicon carbide MOSFET, the margin from the nominal operation conditions is positive 5 volt. Next, let's talk about a rather unknown phenomena in silicon carbide MOSFETs, the shape of the reverse recovery current. Even though silicon carbide body diodes show a very low reverse recovery charge by number, the corresponding current signal is very fast. With increasing temperature, the snappiness, which indicates the speed of return of the reverse recovery current to zero, becomes increasingly dominant. The graph to the left shows actual measurements of an Auden semiconductor 1200 volt 80 milliohm silicon carbide MOSFET reverse recovery current with 800 volt DC link voltage and 38 amps of load current. The black line is the reverse recovery current measured at room temperature. This is a reference for the very low reverse recovery charges in silicon carbide. The blue line is the reverse recovery current measured at a device temperature of 175 degrees Celsius. The fast transients of the reverse recovery current return lag in this curve exceed 40 amperes per nanoseconds, which brings the measurement system to its limits. Filtering the signal to simulate a lower bandwidth current sensing scheme, it can be seen in the red line that with 200 megahertz signal bandwidth already only 10 amps per nanoseconds remain. The green line corresponds to a 50 megahertz bandwidth, which would, for example, be a very fast Rogowski coil. The signal would completely hide the fast transient, but as we will see in a little bit, this actually has an important impact. In the next segment, we want to see what MOSFETs are actually doing in a hard-switched half-bridge configuration and how a good intended attempt to slow down the device actually leads to a bad side effect. The schematic on the left shows a simplified representation of a half-bridge, where the low-side device is the active switch, represented by a MOSFET symbol, and the high-side device is acting as a diode only. Usually the term hard switching is used for switching of an inductive load at full voltage conditions. In this condition, the load current that initially flows through the inductor and the passive device is transferred to the active device. As the inductor can be considered a DC source in the first approximation, all switching currents are confined to the switching loop across both devices and the DC link capacitor. That includes the reverse recovery current of the passive device. The actual load current transfer speed is completely controlled by the active switch. As this is a MOSFET, the speed can be adjusted by the slope of the gate voltage. So why not use a classical RC filter to slow down the signal? Zooming into the schematics of each MOSFET in its package, we get to the equivalent schematic on the left side. Every MOSFET comes with its internal capacitances and internal gate resistance. When this MOSFET is embedded into a package, bond wires and pins will add external inductances to the device nodes. For a TO247 package, as a rule of thumb, each of the legs will show approximately 4 nanohenry of inductance. The RC filter that was just added is outside of this package. When this equivalent schematic is simplified for an AC examination, we can first get rid of the gate driver. As this is supposed to switch between two stable voltages, it 
can be seen as an AC short. As we have seen, the AC switching current needs to flow from drain to source in any condition. So we just get rid of the drain pin and just assume the forced current through the source pin. The gate capacitance is by that represented by a single capacitor to source. Gate and source lag inductances are now forming a resonant tank with the device gate capacitance and the external gate of the source capacitor. The only dampening element in this resonance loop is the internal gate resistor. The external gate resistor does not take part of the action. To see the effects that this resonant tank has on the device gate, we put this circuit that is displayed on top into a simulator. The forced current through the source lag is a representation of a fast reverse recovery event with a mild speed of 10 amps per nanosecond. The element values are taken from the data sheet of the on semiconductor 1200 volt 80 milliohm silicon carbide MOSFET. The external resistor and capacitor are selected to be 10 ohm and 1 nanofarad. The following simulation results will trace both the internal gate voltage across the device gate to source capacitor, as well as the measurable gate voltage across the external gate to source capacitor. The resulting waveforms are displayed on the left. The topmost curve is the forced current, which is a slow ramp up to 10 amps, with the following 10 amp per nanosecond slope back to zero. The middle graph shows the external gate to source voltage. As can be seen, the voltage drops by a maximum of approximately 7 volts. The lowest waveform shows the internal gate to source voltage. This shows an overshoot of roughly 7 volts as well, which would exceed the maximum allowed gate to source voltage if the gate was already at 18 volt or higher at the time this event occurred. As the overshoots in the resonant tank are proportional to the reverse recovery return speed, the stress on the gate oxide can be much higher in a real application. The resulting damage can lead to catastrophic failure after hours of, of operation instead of decades. Another phenomenon that can be caused by the internal gate to source voltage being pulled high is the parasitic turn on of the passive device. When the internal gate to source voltage is pulled high beyond the threshold voltage of the MOSFET, a significant drain current starts to flow. This current hits the enabled active device and forms a shoot-through current, which comes at a fast current slope as well. The current slope can again self-excite the gate loop resonant tank, which leads to an oscillation in the system that is caused by a single reverse recovery event and is self-sustained by a repetition of shoot-through events. The plot on the left is an actual measurement with this phenomenon where a half bridge of two on semiconductor 1200 volt 80 milliohm silicon carbide MOSFETs is paired with an external gate source capacitor at these devices. The red signal is the drain current of the active switch, the green curve the corresponding external gate source voltage. It is self-explaining that this behavior is not healthy for the system. Of course, our goal is to remove any hazards to the performance of the system. As we have identified the gate loop resonant tank as a potential hazard, we remove the external gate source capacitor from the system. As can be seen from the equivalent circuit on the left, the gate loop still forms a resonant tank, but now the external gate resistor is in serious with it and helps dampening the oscillation. This circuit is now put into the same simulation test bench as before. Again, we see the forced current in the topmost waveform, no change here. But now the externally measurable gate source voltage shows a significant drop of over 25 volts. The internal gate source voltage in the lowest graph now just stays calm. The signal does not leave a corridor of 3 volt dynamic stress. This clearly shows that the externally measurable gate source voltage is no reliable indicator for the actual device gate stress. To show you that this simple simulation results translates into the real world, you can see on the left side the measurement of the same half bridge consisting of two on semiconductor 1200 volt 80 milliohm silicon covered MOSFETs as before, this time without the external gate to source capacitors. 
First thing to notice is that the wild oscillations do not occur in the plots. Actually, all signals look reasonably clean now. As can be seen with the green gate to source voltage, just as the red current waveform shows its fast downwards transition, the gate undershoots by approximately 25 volts, just in the simulation before. Now that we have shown how not to control the device speed, it is time to clarify what actually can be done. The simple answer is the external gate resistors are sufficient to control the device speed just on their own. Due to the internal gate capacitance, the gate loop will automatically form an RC filter. The graphs above demonstrate the control ability of the external gate resistor with the example of the on semiconductor 1200 volt 20 milliohm silicon carbide MOSFETs. On the left side, you can see a 3D surface that represents the device voltage transition speed for the on transition on the height axis. The X axis on the left represents the load current. The Y axis on the right represents a variable external gate resistor. The transition speed is only weakly dependent on the load current. The gate resistance has a far more dominant impact on the speed, controlling it, controlling it from less than 20 volts per nanosecond up to 40 volts per nanosecond and above. Even more visible is the dominance of the external gate resistor on the off transition represented with the same axis as before on the right side graph. The off transition is by nature more sensitive to the load current as the load current is the actual charging current for the switch node capacitances. Still, with adjustment of the external gate resistor, the device speed can be controlled between 20 volts per nanosecond and up to over 60 volt per nanosecond. Now that we know that the externally measured gate source voltage may contain huge undershoots without harm to the device, there is still the open question if there is nothing else that can be done to avoid that completely. The answer is coming in form of the equivalent circuit on the left. With one additional pin, the source sense pin, all impact the source pin inductance shows in case of fast transients on loop current can be completely decoupled from the gate loop. Packages with a source sense pin are, for example, T0247 4 lead, as shown in the picture on the left, or D square pack 7 lead. Now the gate loop is still the same as before, but the currents in the loop are not even close as high as the load current is supposed to be. While in the previous package, the active current transition of the active device would result in a drop of the gate driver reference potential, with a source sense connection, the gate does not see any impact from the load current. This allows the device switching speeds to be even higher. As a reference, the same die that in a 3D package achieved average current transition speeds of 1.5 amps per nanosecond shows three times higher current, current transitions of roughly 4.5 amps per nanosecond in a 4-lead package. Thank you very much for your interest and the opportunity to present this to you.